Good morning and welcome to our webinar with Master Gardener volunteer Amy Stripe on Palms 101. My name is Kathy Oliver and I'm a program assistant in the residential horticulture program at UF IFAS Extension, Manatee County. I'd like to thank you all for joining and uh, we are recording this and it will be available on our Manatee County Extension YouTube channel. So you can always go back and uh, refer to the video. For those of you that aren't familiar with Extension, we are a, a organization of the University of Florida and um, every local county government in Florida and in fact throughout the country. So you will find an Extension office in every county. And this is the place where uh, you can get science-based information um, to improve the quality of your life. We have lots of program areas, including sustainable food systems, 4-H youth development, family and consumer sciences, marine sciences, and the residential horticulture program of which the Master Gardener program is a part. And uh, the Master Gardeners are skilled volunteers that bring um, the mission of outreach and education to the community and answering all kinds of horticulture, lawn and gardening questions for the public. And with us today is one of our Master Gardener volunteers, Amy Stripe. She has made it a point to specialize in palms and she really is our go-to person in the program for palms. So welcome, Amy. Thank you. All right, let me share my screen um, so we can get the presentation up. And let me go here to start the presentation. Uh, do I need to get rid of this? Yes. Okay. Very good. So today is a kind of a Palms 101, which means it's an introductory, introductory class to Palms. In the past, I've given um, three part webinars, webinars specifically to uh, deal with particular problems of Palms, but this is kind of the introductory uh, bird's eye view, if you will, of Palms. Uh, by the way, I've been a Master Gardener volunteer here with Manatee County Extension for 13 years. And as Kathy said, I do, there is a fun, a warm place in my heart for palm trees. Um, they're under pressure these days with diseases and, and so forth, but um, there's still a topic, a huge topic of questions that we have in our diagnostic plant clinic uh, that we operate at Extension office. Uh, every weekday except for Wednesdays from nine to four where we take customer questions. So today we're gonna cover a basic palm structure. I'm not gonna get into the anatomy in terms of what each part of the palm is called, but we're gonna really focus on how palms are different from hardwood trees. We're gonna talk about selection of palms and this is not, we're not gonna drill this down to the species level. What we're gonna talk about is criteria for selecting palms for your landscape some tips on planting. We're gonna dwell a bit on maintenance. Maintenance of palm trees in terms of fertilization and pruning is quite critical to the overall health of your palm. And then probably half of the presentation, we're gonna um, show you kind of, we're gonna put some of these things we talk about into practice and answer some frequently asked questions that we get from, um, from some of our customers. So in terms of basic palm structure, um, palms are monocots. That means they have a single seed leaf. That means they have one growing point. Uh, they do not produce bark or wood the way hardwood trees do. So you don't, they don't add concentric rings the way you see in, in hardwood trees. What happens in palm trees is there are vascular bundles that are scattered throughout the trunk uh, that transport water and nutrients up and down the trunk of the palm. Um, think about like a fiber optic cable and that kind of gives you a visual about what those, uh, what those uh, uh, bundles kind of look like. Um, the uh, other implication or consideration of, of being a monocot is that there's no secondary growth. So unlike hardwood trees, which as they grow up, 
also expand outward in terms of trunk width. That does not happen with palms. There's no, uh, there's no trunk diameter increase after it comes out of the ground. So you can see in these pictures, both of these palm trees, this is a coconut palm on the left, a, a Phoenix uh, canariensis or carinella date palm on the right. You can see how they have a full head of hair, a full canopy, but the trunks are kind of squatty. That's because it was waiting for that trunk to get its full diameter before it emerges from the ground. Uh, again, another characteristic of being a monocot and having no secondary growth is that wounds don't heal on palm trunks. On hardwood trees, a, a wound will compartmentalize a health by secondary growth. On palm trees, you definitely want to avoid nailing anything into the trunk. You want to avoid any damage from string trimmers or weed whackers. That kind of damage will not heal. Uh, palm roots are entirely adventitious and they can regenerate. Now, adventitious means that the, uh, the roots do not grow off of other roots. In palms, they grow from the vascular bundles that I described running up and down inside the palm's trunk. There are no tap roots per se. The vast majority of the roots are in the, are a very fibrous mat in the top maybe 24 to 36 inches of the soil, depending on the species. And that has implications for how you fertilize. Uh, we recommend broadcasting granular fertilizer for palm trees. You need to move beyond the so-called drip line, you know, the edges of the canopy when it comes to palms because those roots on mature palms are extending beyond that. Also know that palm tree roots are not destructive of structures or pavers, they won't pop up pavers, they won't put cracks in sidewalks, et cetera. So palm tree roots in that regard are the antithesis of kind of oak tree roots, if you will. All right, let's talk about selecting palms. We've got several criteria, five we're gonna talk about. First and foremost is your zone. What cold hardness zone are you living in in Florida? You need to select the palm tree that's gonna be hardy for that zone. In Florida, we have zones eight at the tippy top in the panhandle, that's colder to warmer to 11 at the, at the, um, in the Keys. Now, this represents the average annual min extreme minimum temperatures that can be experienced in that area. It is critical when you go to a nursery and you select plants, including palms, there's usually a little tag that says hardy to zones six through eight or hardy to zones 10 through 11 or whatever. Pay attention to that little label because this is kind of giving you an idea of what happens if you plant a palm tree outside of its hardiness zone. This is a spindle palm on the left. You can see where this gentleman, he's basically holding in his left hand the spear leaf or the newest unopened leaf of this particular palm. It has pulled out easily out of the growing bud and that doesn't bode well for the, for the life, the survival of that palm. I took this picture on the right of a coconut palm Coconut palms are cold hardy 10A to 11. I took this picture in 9B after a particularly brutal winter we had. This was March of, I believe, 2010, one cold front after another. This palm tree will probably survive, but it will take a couple of years before that entire canopy can be replaced with a healthy growth. Now, this brings up a point uh, that you should know that a palm tree, you know, a palm tree leaf or frond, once it has experienced damage from fungus, disease, nutritional issues, or things like cold damage, you cannot make that green again. It's gonna be, have that phenomenon present forevermore. What's gonna have to happen is a whole new canopy, a whole new growth is gonna have to come in that will eventually replace um, those damaged leaves. Size, okay, this, Picture on the on the left always cracks me up. Okay, this is these are two royal palms that are flanking this now tiny looking house. Um, okay, way out of proportion. So you know, look ahead twenty years. Look ahead twenty years and kind of go, where is the mature height of this tree going to be? Uh, this is kind of insult to injury here with these royals because they are what we call self cleaners. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later on, but suffice it to say, self cleaning palms when they're uh, older leaves uh, get a start senescing or aging, and then they die, they drop off by themselves. So that's going to be 30 to 40 pounds of a dead frond cascading from the heights there as you walk down your stoop there to get your mail. 
not a good plan. The coconut palm on the on the um, right hand side, I don't know if that volunteered there, it was planted there, but clearly when you're planting a palm under power lines, understand the mature height it's going to reach. There's a phenomenon called power line de decline that is unique to palms, not hardwood trees, but palms that kind of makes the canopy look goofy. We don't know why it does that, but sometimes when they get in proximity to power lines, they get they look damaged like this. It's usually not fatal. Again, mature height, this Phoenix robolinii, this is a pygmy date palm there on the left. Okay, pygmy is a misnomer. This can get 15 feet high. Clearly, this was not put in the right place. On the uh, right-hand side here is a fishtail palm. Okay, so width enters into this one now. This is a clumping palm, 15 feet wide or more, probably not a good location next to the house. All right, the next criteria, obvious criteria of any plant in the landscape is the light. Um, specimen palms, usually the taller type palms are full sun jobbies. Uh, we do have, you, if you do have a shadier spot in your yard, there are palms suitable for shadier spots. Understory palms. These are typically palms that you see as house plants, but in, in Florida, because of our climate, we can put them outdoors. Um, keep in mind that understory palms definitely want shade. Shape, do you want a clumping looking thing like this parotis palm on the right, which is a native, or do you like the idea of the solitary trunk? This is a, a Chilean wine palm, it's a stunning palm. But keep in mind that clumping or solitary can be quite tricky. Both of these two palms, these Adenidia morellii, this is the Christmas palm on the left, and this uh, parlor palm on the right, believe it or not, these are not clumping, these are individual palms. And the reason what happens in a nursery is they put these together in, in, you know, in clumps or in pots to put in your landscape this way because on their own, you know, they're just kind of telephone polish. They're kind of just, you know, sticking up. They don't look really, really nice um, on their own, but they are individuals. And having said that, um, they do that with commonly pygmy date palms as well and actually foxtails. Now, because these are individual palms, be prepared it's not at all unusual for one or more of those to fail when they're planted like this. We think it may be due to um, root um, competition or very likely uh, they've been planted too deep. One or more has been planted too deep to try to make them all the same height. And as we're gonna learn later on, uh, planting a palm too deep is pretty much a death knell for a palm tree. The parlor palm, I know hard to believe, but these are individual palms. They could either have done this in a nursery like this, or this have, could have self-sown this way. All right, lastly, we're gonna talk about armature. Spines and teeth are very common on um, palm trees. Um, also on cycads, by the way, which are palm-like, but not in the palm, not in the palm family at all. Um, but they sometimes substitute cycads for palm trees. On the far, uh, on the left here, that is uh, Rapidophyllum hystrix. It is a native, it's a needle palm. It is considered a trunkless palm. So those little needle guys are pretty much gonna stay at ground level like that. If you have, you know, small pets or kids, you might wanna take that into consideration. Uh, the middle picture, that's my favorite, one of my favorites, that's the Gru Gru palm. And those, that, those spines on the trunk are modified trunk tissue, kind of cool. Then on the far, on the right here, we have the European fan palm and look at the teeth on those petioles, the petiole being the kind of the stem of the leaf. Um, there are other, you know, very commonly put, uh, palms put in landscapes, Chinese fan palms have spines. Uh, all the Phoenix, the date palm species have, have spines. Uh, uh, I wanna say Mexican fan palm, saw palmetto also has little teeth that you need to watch out for. All right, so let's talk about a couple of tips on planting palms. Um, I, li I like this picture because it really clearly illustrates how this guy has measured how big his hole is going to be, his planting hole. Um, you want to allow at least six inches uh, in diameter than the root ball. And the reason for this is because you want to make sure that the backfill soil, the soil you take out of the, of the you know, to dig the hole, is the soil you put back in. You want to make sure that it is in even contact with the entire root ball. That will help ensure regeneration of roots. As you remember earlier, I said palm tree roots regenerate, okay? 
So there's a difference in, in, in planting depths between field grown palms and containerized palms. So if you're transplanting a palm from, a, from the field, from the ground into your landscape, kind of the rule of thumb is that you want it to be deep enough so the top of the root ball is even with the surface of the ground. In other words, you want it to be in your landscape, the same depth it was growing in the field. With containerized palms, however, you want to plant that probably an inch deeper than it was than, than, the, than the soil in the container. And the reason for that is because in containers, the soil subsides fairly easily and some of those root initials might not be in good contact. So you want to make sure they're in good contact with the soil in the, the hole you're, you're putting it into in your landscape. Um, here's a couple of examples where in this case, these palms were planted too shallowly. The one on the left, that's a containerized palm. You can see that the soil in the pot has subsided. The palm was not deep enough in the container. So those root initials will probably never enter the soil. So if you were to try to put that in a landscape, you definitely want to put that, you know, so those root initials are in soil. The one on the right, you can see how, um, you can see here, this is where this was attached right here above ground. Whoops, so sorry. Um, and what happened was all of those root initials where the arrow is are basically above ground. They never managed to reach the soil. They basically effectively died. And then this thing toppled over of its own weight. All right, planting too deep. We see more palms planted more deeply, too deeply than too shallowly. Very, very common. And again, when we talked about those clustering, so-called clustering palms, attempts to even up heights of a row of palms. Very commonly, uh, you will find that, that some palms are planted too deep to try to even it up. With the case of uh, cabbage palms, you can see the one that I pointed the arrow to here where it's failing. Cabbage palms come with very small root balls. And so sometimes instead of bothering to stake them, which they should do, they plant them deeply to try to stabilize them. So that's probably what's happened in the case here. They planted this too deep to try to keep it from toppling over or to even it up or what have you, but that happens frequently. Now the um, date palm there on the right, those two palms, believe it or not, were planted at exactly the same time. And you can see the poor little guy there, the left-hand side palm is clearly not keeping up. It might take several years for you to see the uh, the planting too deep phenomenon uh, manifests itself. It might, it might manifest itself quite quickly, but sometimes it might take several years. But um, like I said, planting too deep is really bad. What happens with palms when you plant too deep is that they are, uh, the roots cannot get enough air exchange. Basically they will rot. And so you can, you see things like iron deficiency, uh, magnes or manganese deficiency on these palms and also drought. Uh, um, stress, even in the presence of abundant water. That's because those roots are now rotting, they can't take up nutrients, and they certainly cannot take up water. All right. Um, when you plant palms, do not amend the soil. Don't add black cow or compost or anything else. And the reason why you want to just backfill that hole with the dirt that you took out of the hole because that's the soil that that palm is going to be living in. And as I explained earlier, the palm tree roots are gonna extend out quite far, up to 50 feet or more away from that trunk. So you wanna make sure it gets used to early on the type of soil it's gonna be living in, um, the roots are gonna be existing in, away from the trunk and you know, down the road in the future. Um, you want to water thoroughly to make sure there's no air pockets and you wanna sort of force that backfill soil against the, the root ball of the palm tree. Of course, adding a couple of uh, layers of organic mulch is always a good idea. Do not do, do what we call volcano mulching. You see this frequently where the mulch has been piled up against the trunk of the palm, not good. You wanna make sure that root initiation zone, those root initials that might be above the ground are free and clear of mulch. Uh, you wanna make sure that there's gonna be plenty of air exchange uh, between that root, uh, scenario and the, you know, the outside atmosphere. 
Then you want to establish on larger palms. You do want to brace them for six to eight months. Now, of course, you don't want to drive any nails into the trunk or have any wires rubbing against uh, the trunk. What the um, university recommends is that two by fours were banded together um, over sort of burlap or maybe even asphalt paper and then nailing diagonal uh, braces to those two by fours. Okay, that's kind of a safe way to do it. You uh, want to water daily for the first few weeks in the absence of rain, adequate rainfall. Okay, if it's raining, no supplemental water is probably going to be needed. Watering is tricky in establishing palms. Um, what happens, especially with field grown palms, again, they have to regenerate plenty of roots to, in order to be able to take up water uh, up to the canopy. In many cases, landscapers will cut off a lot of green leaves from canopies when they're first installing uh, palms because they know that root structure cannot support the transpiration of water out of a big leaf mass, if that makes sense. Um, so, you know, putting more water down, thinking that's going to help that transpiration issue is not going to solve it because the root structure is not there to take it up yet, if that makes sense. You want to uh, hold off fertilizing for three to four months after installation for the same reason. You want to make sure there's adequate roots there to take advantage of that fertilizer. Otherwise, you're kind of wasting your time and money. Okay, palm maintenance. I'm going to spend a little bit of time here. This is very important. Most palms in Florida need fertilizing. There are exceptions, of course, are some are native palms like cabbage palms and salt palmetto and so forth typically never need that. But the large majority of ornamental palms in our landscape are not natives. And so they do need supplemental fertilizer. Those of you who have taken my classes before, repeat after me, a palm is much more likely to suffer from and or die of a nutritional deficiency than a disease, pest, insect, or other mechanical issue. Um, it's the uh, point being there that you know, the, it's the main reason you want to study nutritional deficiencies is not to be an expert at knowing, you know, what's missing. You just want to kind of recognize them so that you know it's not a disease or a pest insect or some other issue. You want to be able to distinguish it. There are six uh, nutrients that we see the most common deficiencies of on palm trees here. There are three macronutrients, meaning nutrients that they need in greater quantity. Uh, and there are three micronutrients in very small amounts are needed. So the three macros are up here on K, K which is potassium, mag, um, mag, 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 magnesium, I'll get it out, magnesium um, also, and then in nitrogen. And those deficiencies will occur. You will see those in the oldest growth on palm trees, the oldest growth being the lower leaves. The reason for that is that macronutrients can translocate within the palm from oldest to newest leaves. So here you're the palm tree, you've got a nutritional deficiency problem with these macros. You don't really care about your old leaves because they're gonna die anyway eventually. So you're gonna rob the nutrients from your old leaves, move them up to the new leaves where your growth is occurring. That's how you're gonna stay alive is with new growth. So that translocation results in lower leaves showing these symptoms. So you can see just quickly on the potassium deficiency, again, think oldest leaf and oldest part of the leaf. So notice that the tips of those leaves on that Phoenix robolinii, the tips are dead of the leaflets moving inwards to the rib, and then it's in the lower part of the canopy. So oldest parts of the leaf and oldest leaves. Magnesium um, shows itself as a distinctive yellow V. So you can see sighted halfway through the canopy on a canary island date palm in the middle there, you can see that yellow V. And then you can see the necrotic or dead lower um, potassium deficient uh, leaves. And then nitrogen just manifests itself as kind of overall yellow. Um, in terms of the micros, now micro, micronutrient deficiency can actually kill a palm much faster than a macro deficiency. So iron is characterized by kind of sort of really dark green, you know, veins against yellow tissue. Uh, manganese has all sorts of weird things it does, but frizzletop is a very common thing. 
You can see a picture of that in the middle there, that frizzle top. And then boron does very goofy things. Boron deforms the, the leaves, kind of deforms the, the, um, the, the leaf bases, causes accordion effects on leaflets, et cetera. The thing to keep in mind with these deficiencies is do not spot treat them. I mean, unless you're a total expert, um, a professional landscaper perhaps even, don't try to spot treat. And the reason for that is because certain of these nutrients are what we call antagonistic. So too much of one in the absence of the correct ratio of the other will create a problem. So for example, nitrogen and potassium are antagonistic. If you put more nitrogen on a palm tree in the absence of the correct ratio of potassium, you will be creating a potassium deficiency. Nitrogen creates a burst of new growth and then if you don't have the right level of potassium to keep up with it, you're gonna have a deficiency there. Um, we often hear people say, well, uh, you know, Epsom salts, great, because you know, magnesium deficiency is very common, very common on palm trees. And Epsom salts are magnesium sulfate, save it for your bathtub. Now there are some Epsom salts which are labeled as fertilizers, but we don't recommend that because they're completely water soluble. They will wash away at the first heavy rainfall. And the university recommends time release or slow release um, ingredients in the fertilizers. Also boron, 20 mule team borax, everybody heard of that, save it for the laundry room. A tiny bit of boron is all that is needed in palms. You want it to be applied as a balanced fertilizer. Too much boron is highly toxic. So to repeat, most palms in Florida need fertilizer. This is to correct correct unsightly deficiency syndromes, and also keep in mind that some deficiencies can be fatal. We don't want that to happen. So university says recommend, use a balanced, especially palm fertilizer. The formulation, the analysis, 8 to 12, that's NPK plus four magnesium. So eight nitrogen, two phosphorus, 12K potassium plus four magnesium. Those are your macros. Or if you live in a county where phosphorus is Banned in fertilizer 8012 plus four. Um, the university says if you don't have the right formulation, don't use any fertilizer at all because it can create more problems, especially in terms of these antagonistic properties I talked about. If you contact us at Manatee County Extension, the Master Gardener Volunteers, we actually can give you information about where to find the specially formulated blends uh, of fertilizer in Manatee County. Um, because stuff that's sold at the big box store might say 8212, but there may be some other things about those formulations that are not spot on according to university spec. So, all right, pruning, another critical part uh, of, of palm maintenance. Now there are two types of um, growing points on palms. There's the crown with the crown shaft type. So things like royal palms, Christmas palms, um, Areca palms are all self cleaners. That means, again, as we said earlier, that the oldest leaf, you know, these are the leaf bases here, the crown shaft. And um, what happens there is that those crown, the, the, um, as the leaf ages, eventually it will die and fall off by itself. Under no circumstances should you prune leaves on a self cleaner. First of all, complete waste of your time. It's going to do it by itself anyway. And you can do damage. Um, if you see a leaf starting to senesce, getting old, starting to die, um, and it starts to peel off and it's hanging, hanging, don't resist the temptation to yank it down. Don't do that. Let it happen naturally. Now, when it comes to flower stalks or fruits, that's a different story on, on self-cleaners. We'll talk about that here in a minute. On the um, palms that have no crown shaft, I call those the you cleaning palms. And so the common ones are things like Mexican fan palm or queen palms. There's a number of palms that, that just, what happens is when those leaves senesce and then die, they just kind of hang there until you cut them off <laughs> or until a wind event comes along. Now some of these palms, in some palms, they can persist for a long time. I quite like the dead skirt leaf on Mexican fan palms, but that's just me. I'm an old Florida type of gal. Okay. Um, this is so-called hurricane pruning. And you've seen this all over town, I'm sure. This is where they remove green fronds um, prematurely. And this does affect the health and vigor of palms. 
So there are two, there's two rationale, there's you know, two reasons given to rationalize why this is done. The notion is that to remove live fronds reduces future pruning requirements, right? So here I am, I'm up in the bucket truck, I'm taking off the dead stuff, the brown leaves, and I'm gonna take the yellow ones, which you really shouldn't because there's still nutrients in the yellow ones, but I'll take those because they don't look good. And I might as well cut off, cut off the next couple of layers of green leaves because I'm gonna have to cut those off eventually someday anyway, because they're gonna die. Okay, well, what happens is just the opposite of what you might think. Um, for palms that are already deficient in uh, macronutrients, trimming off those older leaves basically pushes the deficiency up through the canopy, causing it to senesce or die off or age prematurely. So in other words, you've taken off sort of the yellow leaves, which are still, probably there's still some nutrients translocating. And then you're taking off the next set of green, which is where we would go next uh, for our macros. And there now they're gone. So I've got to move higher up the canopy. So if you leave like three leaves left, you're going to have no leaves left um, by the end of this process. So it is really um, not, not a good practice. I'm sorry here, hang on. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that where that circle is, now that is where the, the um, that's where the, the, the caliper of the trunk, that, that's the development point where it actually should be increasing, you know, to be in compliance, I guess you can say, with the normal width. Well, by taking away nutrition rich leaves, you're compromising the ability of the palm to um, get that caliper the correct size. That is a very dangerous um, situation there. That's a very weak point on the palm. So the second rationale people use is saying, well, you know, the fewer fronds I have, the less windage I'm going to have in a hurricane, the less risk of having, you know, a toppled palm. Just the opposite is true. Again, those little leaflets on those palm leaves or the segments like on fan palms, again, the wind's going to go straight through those. They're kind of uniquely designed for high wind events. And don't forget that the stem of the palm, the trunk, which is technically the stem, is flexible. So what's gonna happen probably to this poor sable palm here, this poor cabbage palm, is that might easily snap off there in a high wind where that caliper of the trunk um, has been, had stunted development. All right, quickly removing uh, flower stalks or fruits is a perfectly fine practice. In fact, producing flowers and fruits does take energy out of a palm. So it's, it's not a bad thing to do. Um, now, in some cases, like you've got a coconut palm that's near a sidewalk or a structure, it's probably a good idea to take those, those uh, fruits off. Now, bees really particularly like certain palm inflorescences or flowers. And I know we've got lots of cabbage palms in my yard. My husband likes to kind of tine it just, so, but just to get that stalk out of there before the fruit develops. <laughs> we don't always get it right. And then if we miss it, we have lots of little cabbage palms coming up everywhere. <laughs> so that's um, that's kind of the first half of the presentation. I think we're doing we're run a little bit ahead of time. Um, these are questions that we get in our diagnostic plant clinic, and these are customer questions frequently asked about roots, trunks, and leaves. I've sort of uh, labeled each one of these questions in the slides to come with like the little green face there, that little winky guy with the smile, going, "Hey, that's not a problem." Not an issue, don't worry. The guy in the middle is kind of, he's doubtful. He thinks, ah, oh, this could go either way. Like I gotta keep an eye on it. The guy, the poor and happy guy, the blue face there, this is gonna be a big issue with this, with this particular um, question that's going on. Now, now, one thing to know as a customer, the history of your palm is critical in diagnosing problems sometimes. Um, in the absence of knowing like when it was planted, how it's been fertilized, watered, um, whether it's put on flower or fruit before. In the absence of those kinds of details, uh, sometimes it's very hard to get to uh, diagnostics. The other thing I always tell people is, look at the canopy. If the canopy is looking pretty healthy and you see something goofy like in the trunk, it might not be an issue. It might just be a goofy thing that, that palms do. Okay, so let's start with roots. We've talked about these adventitious roots. This is a very common question where we see the aerial portion of the root initiation zone kind of popping up. This happens a lot on mature palms, cabbage palms, foxtails, et cetera. You will see the same type of thing on some date palm species, the phoenix palms. 
there's that aerial portion of the root initiation zone can go up the trunk several feet. Now those roots are dead, they're in contact with the air, not in the soil, but this is not an issue. Again, this flaring out here at the, at the base of a trunk where, where the pseudo bark, the pseudo bark is splitting um, and the roots are kind of exposed, very common on mature palms, not an issue. This is an issue. This customer plant had, uh, these are European fan palms. Now, again, to my point, look at the canopy here, doesn't look right. So we took a look at the picture on the left there. You can see these roots coming out of the trunk. They're like in bare air there, They're, you know. So these were planted too shallowly. What we told the customer to do was to build up some soil around these bases. We also told her to cut off a significant amount of those old leaves, those ones that are drooping there because they're never gonna recover. And they're in fact robbing moisture um, from the new leaves. You want the new leaves to grow there. So we told her cut off some of those old, uh, maybe all of those old leaves to try to give those roots an opportunity to redevelop so that they can take up water. Um, stuff growing on trunks. Okay, we get questions about this all the time. Lichen, that middle picture, that's lichen. The picture on the far, or on the right is lichen. The picture on the left is an epiphyte. An epiphyte is an air plant. They don't take anything away. They just live there. Um, lichen develops often on the north side of trunks of trees and palms. It is not an issue. This is an issue, stuff growing on the trunks. If you see these mushroom-like things, in the bottom four to five feet of your palm, this is Ganoderma zonatum. It is a fungal disease that is fatal. Uh, the game changer thing about Ganoderma is that it is not host specific. It affects every single palm species. Uh, it is a soil borne disease, but it also is spread by spores. And if you see these, we call these conchs, they're kind of stemless mushrooms that are attached to the trunk there. If you see them, and they're still creamy white, it has not released its spores yet. You can remove those, bag them up, put them in your trash to avoid those spores getting to other palms in your landscape. If they're kind of a molasses brown, they've already released spores, it's kind of too late. Now this is the sign of the disease coming out of the trunk. So this palm tree is already infected. The likelihood of you being able to save this palm tree is slim to none. They don't always have these conchs. This is what we call one of those cryptic diseases. Um, you might see some decline in the canopy. You will see some decline in the canopy, but it might be, you might think it's something else. Um, but this is kind of a, a problem we've seen a lot, especially with clumping palms, because people tend to cut to thin out the canes of clumpers, and that is perfect uh, growing grounds for Ganoderma. So this is bad news. Um, boots on trunks. Boots on or off. Well, this is the uh, Mexican fan palm here on the left. Mexican fan palms have boots. Boots are leaf bases that are left behind when the leaf falls off. They're called boots, by the way, because in the olden days, they used those as boot jacks, <laughs> which makes sense, you know, things to take your boots off with. So, uh, on, strangely enough, on Mexican fan palms, when they get more mature to uh, 30 feet or so, all of a sudden they start to shed in their boots. We don't know why, they just do that. So you will see them with and without boots depending on the height and the age. Now cabbage palms, this is a stand of cabbage palms on the right. You can see that one has the boots fully intact, the others don't. We don't know why that happens. They are all grown from seeds, so they're genetic individuals. There are some theories that maybe insects sometimes might colonize inside boots and cause damage and eventually cause boots to fall off. But in any case, it is not a problem. Now, stuff growing in the boots it, on the right, those are epiphytic ferns. You see that frequently. This is a cabbage palm again. Those are growing in the boots there. And speaking of the boot you know, phenomenon, see how goofy some of those boots are falling off there. That's just the way it does. Now, on the other hand, the picture on the left, this is Ficus aurea as a native. This is the strangler fig, notorious for germinating their seed in the boots of uh, cabbage palms, and it's called strangler fig for a reason. You do, if you see this, you want to remove it because here you see a dead host on the right. It, true to its name, it will kill its host. And you see this a lot uh, in undisturbed areas, in preserves and parks around the county here in uh, Manny County, anyway. Okay. Um, 
holes in trunks or peeling bark. It's not uncommon to find you know, old specimens of palms of various species um, with eroded trunks. This is the, the, the um, pseudo bark that is, or that is you know, coming off the outside for whatever reason. And you know, in most cases, the central cylinder where we have those, you know, those, that, those fiber optics, um, if that is not damaged or compromised, you know, this is just maybe an unsightly thing here to see. But as long as that vascular tissue remains intact, you're pretty, you're good to go here. Um, it's very common on cabbage palms, but also on foxtails and queens. Now, this is where I speak to the history and kind of background on palm trees. We did have a case come into the plant clinic several years ago where we saw holes kind of like the ones you see uh, on the right there. And they were all on one side of the trunk, all within kind of a certain, you know, three or four feet uh, of each other. And we sort of asked, and finally we discovered that this palm was planted on a golf green. And the side that was facing the green is where all the holes were. You can put two and two together there, obviously. Now, um, if these are not weeping, these holes like this, it's not a problem. But if you see things like this, where there are weeping holes, we call these shot holes, this is a problem. Um, lightning damage will do this. When lightning strikes, it superheats the moisture inside the, the, the trunk. It's got to go, it expands, it's got to go somewhere, it goes out like this. And this weeping will never stop. And this kind of is an entry point for other things like Thelobiopsis trunk rot, which I'm going to talk about in a second. Um, if a lightning strike does not kill the tree outright, it might survive, but the long term prospects are not really great. So, this is Thelobiopsis trunk rot. And a wound has to be present on a palm tree to get this fungal pathogen. You will see very often weeping, like this, like the picture on the right. That tissue there will be soft. It might smell bad. And what thelobiopsis does is it basically attacks the non-lignified tissue of the trunk. Lignified tissue is the more woody tissue. So the older tissues at the bottom, the newer tissue, non-lignified at the top. And that's why you see this poor guy bent in half up here at the top or bent in two at the top um, in the left photo. So no cure for th thelobiopsis. By the way, I should have said on the um, Ganoderma, do not plant another palm in the place where you've lost one to Ganoderma because it persists in the soil. And again, it affects every plant. With thelobiopsis, you can take a chance, even though thelobiopsis also persists in soil, so long as you can protect your palm from wounds, and that includes birds pecking at it and stuff like that, then you're gonna be okay because there has to be a wound present. Speaking of birds, this is the sap sucker and this little chap, he's in here getting sugars. And then sometimes he's going after insects that go in there to get after the sugars of the holes he's created. And they create this kind of ring of, you know, of, um, of, of holes around the, around the trunk. And you might get some crown die back and you might lose a little bit of vigor in the palm. Um, so it's, you know, under certain circumstances, it bears watching. That's why I have kind of that, hmm, gotta watch it face there. Okay, water stress um, from drought or too much water. Um, you can see this, a too little water will contract the trunk. Um, excess uptake of water will create splits like that in the, in the uh, pseudo bark, like the picture on the right. These usually are not structurally damaging to the palm that can be corrected unless the drought situation is caused from being planted too deep. Now, remember we said when you plant it too deep, the roots start rotting. They can't take up water. So in effect, it is creating its own drought-like conditions. So planted too deep, a bit of a difficult thing to correct than if it's simply a question of weather drought conditions, for example. Okay, constriction, trunk constriction. You can see on these various cabbage palms where the, you know, where the trunks are kind of in various places are kind of constricted up and down the trunks. All cabbage palms are harvested from undisturbed areas, ranch lands, farmlands. So, you know, we can't really control the environmental conditions in those situations. And that just reflects a change in the environmental condition. So the, it was growing and growing and growing. And then maybe there was a drought period. So the trunk constricts at that point and then things get corrected and the new growth comes in better. It depends on how serious this is. Usually they can live with it. Um, I've seen some cases of really serious trunk constri constri uh, constriction, 
but in terms of uh, being a real, real worry, not too much. Okay, uh, this is the uh, common, This we see this commonly, people send us these kind of pictures all the time. They go, what happened? Why is there this gap in the canopy on my Phoenix, you know, my Canary Island date palm? Well, what's happened is the, uh, the flower and fruit stock, subsequent fruit stock, on this particular species of palm is what we call intrafoliar. So it grows in the middle of the canopy. And when the, when the fruit gets really heavy, it might kind of push some of those lower leaves down. And then what's happened is that fruit stalk has been pruned away and left that gap. So you can see in the picture on the right where that fruit and flower stalk occurs. It occurs right in the middle of the canopy. So that is not an issue. Okay, on the leaves also, we have a condition I call a plant dandruff called scurf. It occurs on uh, a lot of palms in the date palm family, like, um, like in Phoenix family, very, very prevalent on pygmy date palms. It looks like scale, but it's completely normal. It occurs on foxtails in the form of, it almost looks fungal, this black stuff, but it's perfectly normal. So what you gotta do is sort of study it and say, do I see any actual damage? Like if this were a scale insect, you would see probably yellow or brown spots on these leaflets and on that on this rachis, this mid rib here. Same thing on this um, foxtail. These these fronds look pretty healthy. So again, that's just a naturally occurring thing. I just call it plant dandruff. Sago, the sago plants also get scurf. Um, there's also a phenomenon called romenta that. Uh, on Christmas palms. They look like just little filaments, little black filaments on the leaflets and sometimes on the mid ribs, completely normal, not a problem. Rains are um, originally their connective tissue that attaches along the edges of the leaflets when they're in unfurled leaves and unfolded leaves. And then usually those just fall off, but in some cases they persist like on foxtails, on Christmas palms, on cabbage palms, you just see those, that little strip of tissue and that's a nothing. Okay, normal leaf senescence. Um, we just got this one in this week. Um, the gentleman was concerned on his Christmas palm. He said, what is that discoloration on my, you know, on my crown shaft there? Well, that is actually a leaf base. Those are the leaf bases again. That is a senescing older leaf, an aging leaf, which is getting ready to completely turn yellow, then brown, and then fall off. So that's not a concern. Right. Um, power line decline. I referred to this earlier. I took all these pictures in my neighborhood. You can see the Bismarck palm up there on the upper right. You can see where the power line's going through there. You can see the cabbage palm in the middle top. You can see the royal palm there. You can hardly see the power line there, but it's going right through the middle. Again, you can see the power line on the cabbage palm on the upper, uh, upper right. And then the royal in the background here, you can see this. Again, we don't know what causes this, why it's just palm trees. Sometimes the entire canopy will be engaged, sometimes just the side closest to the power line, not fatal, but an eyesore. So bottom line here, don't plant a tall palm under a power line. Lethal bronzing disease. I'm sure you have heard uh, about this. It's been in the news a lot lately. It used to be called Texas Phoenix palm decline. It's no longer limited to uh, Phoenix species date palms, and it's no longer just in Texas. We have it rampant now in our central Florida, moving through South Florida. And this is a fatal disease caused by a bacterium without a cell wall. The deal here is that it's vectored or it's carried by a little leaf hopper who feeds on an infected palm and then goes to a healthy palm and feeds on that one and transmits the disease. Uh, it's once, it, once it's infected, it's not curable. It's characterized by half or more of the canopy dying quite quickly uh, after premature fruit drop or leaf or flower drop, if there is any present when it, when it gets infected. And you see, it takes on this bronze coloration. And then the next thing you see is the death of the spear. So you can see in that cabbage palm there, on the, on, the, on the left, you can see how the spear leaf at the very top is dead whilst some of those newer leaves are still green. Once it reaches this stage, it's a goner. Um, well, once it's infected, period, it's a goner. But once it reaches this stage, um, there's nothing you can do to prevent it spreading uh, in the rest of your landscape. So these are all pictures provided by Dr. Bader, who is chasing down control for the 
leafhopper who's called Haplaxius crudus. This is not going to be a thing that we're going to be able to control in landscapes at this point. Uh, but in nursery settings where you can control insect vectors, uh, this will be important uh, news to, to watch for. Now, you can apply preventative antibiotics. I wouldn't do it for cabbage palm. It's not a high value palm, but if you have a high value palm like Canary Island date palm or something like that, uh, you can apply an antibiotic, oxytetracycline, every four to, every like four months or so for the life of the palm. It's not an expensive process, but it is requires persistence. Now, proper hygiene would tell you test the test that palm first for presence of lethal bronzing. If it already has it, forget the injections, it's not gonna do any good. It's only a preventative measure. Okay. Um, decline, by the way, is about three to six months on this. And we see this in undisturbed areas in Manatee County all the time. Um, and we're starting to see it more and more in people's landscapes. I've lost two cabbage palms to it in my landscape. All right. Um, the palmetto weevil, these guys, they vary in color and size, as you can see by that upper left-hand picture. The, the, um, the female lays her eggs in the heart or growing bud of palms. The larvae are the ones that do the damage. They feed and feed and feed and feed on that growing point. And this is another what we call cryptic thing. You don't know you've got it until, uh, like the picture on the right, the entire thing collapses. Now notice that the, some of those older leaves, those bottom leaves are still green. That's because this weevil larva is compromising the growing bud. So that's why the new leaves look terrible, whereas the old leaves are looking, hey, they're droopy, but they're still green. What happens here is you don't know you have it until the canopy collapses. Um, if you know that this bug is in the neighborhood, if you have a high value palm, like a Kieran Island date palm, you probably uh, might want to apply a systemic a pesticide, insecticide that targets piercing sucking insects like these larvae. Um, Bismarck is another favorite of this of this weevil. And I think that's simply because both of those are big palms. They've got big, big growing buds, plenty of food for her babies to feed on. But both of those are very high value palms. So you might want to consider a systemic um, drench on those. All right, let's talk about nutrition because we have, we, you know, this is probably the most frequent problems we have with people coming in with issues. So this is a boron deficiency on this little baby foxtail here. You can see how the crown shaft is split. And um, we arrived at this conclusion because boron does do goofy things to cellular structures. We're sort of used to seeing that typical picture, that middle picture there. But we sort of asked around, we asked some other palm experts in the area and they go, yeah, that's probably boron. It can be corrected. It will take a long time. And given the sort of the youth of that palm, it's not particularly high value, might as well just replace it instead of trying to fool with it, correcting it. Um, this is a queen palm. This is a very common site. I mean, this at least has nitrogen, magnesium, and potassium deficiencies that I can see from this picture. This palm will die a death in the next probably two to three months unless it is um, treated with, unless it's given proper fertilizer. Again, you're not going to green up the leaves that are yellow. You're gonna to have to wait for the new growth to come in green. And that could take, depending on the palm, it could take two to three years to come for a nice, healthy, you know, uh, canopy to come back. Uh, it will, like I said, it will kill this palm if this is left unchecked. This is foxtails. Foxtails, by the way, are notoriously deficient in, in, uh, in, in uh, nutrients in our landscapes, at least here in Manatee County. So here I'm identifying magnesium, potassium, and manganese, which is in the, the newer leaves. Again, this can be corrected and probably, uh, you know, I, I'm the magnesium deficient, or manganese deficiency might kill this palm. But at this point, you know, I think I would take the steps to fertilizing it properly and thinking that it could be, uh, could be corrected again. The process will take a couple of years. Okay, that's all I have for you today. Um, so we're just about under an hour, which is excellent. 
Now, if you have palm tree questions, please do. You can contact us here in Manatee County at the plant clinic. Uh, that's our phone number. The prompt on our message machine says for the plant clinic, press one. You can visit us in person. This is our address. We're across from the, uh, Palmetto High School. We're open Monday through Friday, except Wednesdays, nine to four. We'd love to see you in person. Or you can send a photo and emails to manatee.mg at gmail.com. Online resources, um, go to ask IFAS colon palms UFL slash edu that will take you to a page of topics and subtopics on palms. There are easily 60 publications in there on palms ranging from how to fertilize, um, how to plant, how to prune, how to deal with cold damage, specific um, publications on specific species, um, a, just a, a there's also a key in there, diagnostic plant problems or plant palm problems key, and it's an excellent, excellent resource. Now on Saturday, we are conducting, uh, I will be there, I'm conducting a tour. We're just doing a little walk about the extension office grounds. It's not a long trek, um, but we're gonna be walking around and we're gonna look at the, some of the palms we have growing on the grounds of the extension office. Um, that's going to be from 9 to 11. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, how to identify different palm species, how to distinguish some of them. I'll be talking about some of these things we just dealt with, like nutritional issues. And um, don't forget, you can sign up on Eventbrite. I think we still have a few slots available. And I encourage you to do so. Uh, don't forget sun protection and to bring some water. So that's all I have. Uh, so I'm back to you, Kathy. Okay, thank you, Amy. What a great overview of palms. And uh, I'm glad to see we have a couple of master gardeners on the call because it's a great refresher for palms and especially those frequently asked questions that come into our plant clinic. So thank you very much for that. And we can take some questions if anyone would like to put questions in the chat or you could unmute yourself if you'd like and ask a question directly. Uh, I This is Jerry. I got on late, so I missed some of it, but I want to know if I could apply all the knowledge I learned today um, to a indoor palm, like a, mag a mag magis magis majesty indoor palm. Uh, y yes, Jerry, you can. Um, there are a lot of differences though involved with growing palms indoors. The number one issue is light. And I know majesty palms are kind of shadier types of palms. So that's probably, you know, suitable for indoors. So light is critical, but also is the amount of humidity indoors. Uh, obviously indoor plants tend to dry out a lot more quickly than outdoor plants because of air conditioning and so forth. Um, the other thing that is a bit different, if you're growing your majesty plant in a or palm in a, in, a, in a pot indoors, you've got some very specific uh, watering issues to take into consideration. So I actually did do a presentation on indoor palms, which I can send to you. Um, and it, you, you can see how specifically things differ. Uh, the, also, <laughs> it's the same, but different. Also, um, indoor plants and palms tend to get different types of pest issues than outdoors. So, but in terms of things like fertilization, yeah, pretty much you can apply that. What um, about trying, like I had it in a small pot, I put it in a larger pot and I'm thinking after hearing you that maybe I didn't plant it deep enough in that pot because I went to pick it up yesterday and the whole stem just came right off the, the trunk, just disintegrated. Oh, you know, that's not good. The root ball, yeah. So yeah. it was something major. <laughs> something yeah major. yeah did you see what was were the root initials above grant above the, the soil in the container or were they in there deep they would they were below yeah they were okay, much so below. maybe too deep yeah so maybe the roots had rotted that's what it, it looked like rot that, yeah that's, that's what probably it what it was and that's also a, a problem with indoor palms because the water issues are very very tricky there um you really kind of want to let them dry, let them dry out between waterings um, and that type of thing. So, but Thank I'll send you, you that presentation. Oh, I, you have my email. Thank you. Yes, I do. I know where well, you live. It was a wonderful <laughs> presentation. I love the way you incorporated the most frequent asked questions at the clinic. Well, it thanks, Jerry. That's great feedback. 
I just got, you know, I just found it the last minute. So that's why I was late. But at least I found it. <laughs> well, it's no problem because we're gonna we've recorded it, so you can go look at the first part. No problem. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Let me just check the chat here. Thank you very much, Amy. Your expertise is much appreciated. Thank you. <laughs> If we have no more questions, I am going to go ahead and end the meeting. Excellent timing and one hour. And thank you so much, Amy. You're welcome, and Kathy. We'll Thanks see you everybody. on Saturday. Okay. Bye-bye.